I need you to do me a favor, okay? Some of you have got to be Baptists. It's just impossible because all of you back there are Baptists. Because Baptists always sit in the back. <laughs> now, now, you, know, you must understand something. Uh, I used to try to do radio programs uh, with no audience. I cannot do it. Uh, I cannot speak without an audience. It just doesn't work. Would you come down? Please. I beg you. I need you. I need you to come down. Just fill in a little bit down here. You guys can stay there. You're close enough to the middle. But those people over there, you come down. I need you. I really, I'm dead serious. Uh, you know, uh, some people can, uh, some people that are normal uh, can speak regardless. I'll be really honest with you. I feed off the audience. I'm dead serious. I, if I do not have a reaction, I just fall apart. And, and I watch you, and, and believe it or not, I, I pick out people in an audience. I'll find out which one of you are they're driving me on. Uh, and it, it's just uh, that it helps me a great deal, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, and when everybody's scattered all over the place, uh, you, you, there's a few things you don't understand about old age either. I was fine until I had to go to bifocals. Uh, but, you know, then you, you can't, you, you know, when you're, you know, you're, you're, you're having to try to see the audience moving your head 52 directions. And uh, it just helps me a whole lot. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is dead serious business. Last night I started on this matter of the, of, the, of the New Jerusalem. How many of you bad people were not here last night? How many were you not here last night? I just got to figure out, oh, I don't know, you, you know, something ought to happen to you. Uh, but we've got to review just a little bit, if I can only tuck this thing in, because if I don't, what happens is I step on it. And if I step on it, who knows what will happen. Uh, last night we talked about the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, and you know, uh, uh, I, I cannot go over the whole thing, but I can go over part. We, we describe this scene from the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, and, and, uh, and John the Apostle sees, or he hears the Lord speaking to him, Behold, I am making all things new. And then an angel shows up to John. And the angel speaks to him and he says, Come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And uh, I'm not used to having angels speak to me. I think I would be rather jolted. John seemed to have taken it right in hand. And he didn't say, Who are you? I mean, you know, he didn't say, Gee, I'm not used to speaking to angels. He just, you know, the, the angel said. I imagine if an angel appears to you, you better just do what the angel says. That's probably good advice. But the angel says, come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife, and the lamb. And what happens is, and he says, he took me away in the spirit. Crucial statement. Took me away in the spirit. He probably was physically, probably on the island of Patmos, and uh, probably didn't move an inch. Probably didn't even move an eighth of an inch. Probably just dead still, but was carried away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And, and he showed me the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And then he describes this city. And he describes this city with this, this, this 1,500 mile cube. And, and uh, I, I mentioned before and then in the questions and answers afterwards, I don't know what this 1,500 mile cube thing means. I don't understand that. I don't know if it means it's literally 1,500 miles in, in Greek, it's, it's 1,200 cubits, uh, and uh, I imagine it's a figurative number. And the wall is 72, uh, 72 yards thick, and it's made out of precious stones, and it names all these precious and semi-precious stones. Father Gordon's a semi-precious stone, I'm a precious stone. <laughs> The, uh, that's the other way around, I forgot. Uh, but, before we finished last night, as we talked about this, what we're describing is a city that's made out of living stones, and the main living stone is Jesus himself, who is a living stone. That's what St. Peter calls him. He calls him a living stone, and he calls Christians living stones, choice and precious in the sight of God, and, uh, and this city is made out of people. And I can't fathom what that's like either. I just, I mean, it's incomprehensible, incomprehensible, come, got my words mixed. Incomprehensible to me 
what all this means, except it's got to be grand. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I think about this very often. One reason this is so important in my mind, other than that, as I mentioned last night, I got a glimpse of this one time, just a little glimpse in 1969 uh, on, a, on a morning uh, living in the mountains in Southern California. I got this, this, this tiny glimpse of what this was like, and it, it'll motivate me till the end of my life. I need to know where I'm going. I had a college, a seminary professor one time who had a statement that most of you have probably heard, but he said, if you shoot at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And uh, that really made an impression on me. Yeah, but I need that in my life. I need to know where I'm heading. And I know where I'm heading. I'm heading towards that new Jerusalem. I'm heading towards that city coming down out of heaven from God. And as a matter of fact, I, I imagine I'm going to get to do this even here, Sunday morning at St. Barnabas, or Sunday afternoon at St. Barnabas, uh, because now certain people are often late to things. And he's going to be legitimately late on Sunday, for once, legitimately late. But I'll be able to say, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Now, it isn't just blessed is the kingdom. It's now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Because what we're going to participate in together, wherever you go, if you're in an Orthodox church on Sunday morning, we believe that, that the service takes place in heaven. It's not an earthly service at all. And I may get into that. For example, that's why there's certain kinds of music we don't do in, uh, in heaven. There's certain music that's legitimate. I'll, you know, I'll do some of this right now while I'm wide awake. Uh, there's certain music that's very legitimate on earth, but the angels don't like it in heaven. You know, there's certain music that's just not appropriate for heaven. There's stuff you don't play for God's mom. There's stuff you don't play for Gabriel and Michael and the cherubim and the seraphim, six-winged, many-eyed, soaring on their wings, singing and proclaiming and shouting the hymn of victory. And they don't sing rock of my soul. And they don't, they don't, they don't sing Christian rock. They sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And that's about all they sing. And, uh, and this, this whole business of heaven. And so as we get into this in, in, in the divine liturgy, on, on, um, usually on Sunday morning, not only, but usually on Sunday morning, where it's this blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. And, and what we participate in there on Sunday is what we're going to be participating into eternity. And frankly, folks, if you're bored with the liturgy, you'll probably be bored with heaven. So you got an option. You can go to hell. Or you can start liking the liturgy. <laughs> and I recommend you start liking the liturgy. And you will if you understand it. Do you know who's not bored in the liturgy? The priest is not bored. I mean, you're watching every minute. I want to tell you, preaching's a piece of cake. Okay? Preaching's easy. Doing the services is hard. I don't care how many people are in the service. I'm nervous. Very nervous in the service. Why? I don't want to screw up when the Lord's there. I don't want to mess up in front of the angels. I want to do it right. Oh, this all has to do with where I'm going tonight. All has to do with where I'm going. Oh, shut up. <laughs> he dings me every time he doesn't like what I say. <laughs> it's probably the devil. Uh, but it is so crucial we get this, this, this little piece from last night where we, we were talking about this holy city coming down of heaven, out of heaven from God. It's the church. It's the church. I'll get you there tonight. If I don't get you all the way there tonight, I'll get you there tomorrow night. Because that's what he sees coming down out of heaven from God. This new Jerusalem. This is our mother. This is the church. This is the bride of Christ. This is we. Some of you would say this is us. But I told you last night I'm into grammar. <laughs> so it's this is we. Uh, but this is, this, this is the church. This is, this is the, the people of God. And they're living... Whatever a city is, it's made out of living people that are its, 
the apostles are its foundation stones, and uh, its gates are pearls, and, and these are living pearls. All of this is very real stuff, and this is forever. This is what will be forever and ever and ever. Now, I'm not going to do any more review as such from last night, but where I want to take you today, this evening, is to a, a different place, and I'm going to get there slowly. My name is Jonathan, really, and by some quirk, I was actually ordained as Jonathan. Metropolitan Philip, who ordained me, had no idea my name was Jonathan. But when those hands went on me, I clearly heard the name Jonathan. And I never get called Jonathan when I was a child. Nobody was named Jonathan, and I was embarrassed to be Jonathan. I'm a dumb name, I thought. And I love it now. Uh, but I'm Jonathan, and my brother, of course, who's seven and a half years older than I, he died when he was very young, 32. My brother's name, of course, was David. And so I love David, uh, and I'm impressed with Jonathan. <laughs> but I love the David. David, uh, we were named after David and Jonathan in the Bible. The, the great friends, and actually my brother and I were great friends. And I've loved David ever since I had a brother named David, and I've never been without a brother named David. David was a unique man. He was a man after God's own heart. And David had a, a particular passion that I've been aware of most of my life. David had a very unusual passion regarding God. What he wanted to do was to build a house for God. He didn't get to do the building himself. He was a man of war. And God told him that it wouldn't be he that would get to build the building, that would get, get to build the physical temple, to build the house. His son would build it, Solomon. And Solomon built the temple. And when you read the Old Testament, you cannot help but be startled by how much copy, just sheer pages, ink, is given to the building of the temple. If you take the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple, you've got volumes in the Old Testament about how every little thing was to be made in the temple. And how what happened in this temple, these two very unique structures, the tabernacle in the wilderness and ultimately the temple in Jerusalem. What was so uh, utterly unique about them is that the glory of God came down and, and, and filled them uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple, the glory of God, that Shekinah glory came down and filled them. Now, why would David be so interested? Why would God's friend be so interested in building a house for God? I'm going to give you the answer. Don't you answer. I'm going to answer. The reason that he was so interested in building a house for God now, are you with me? Wake up if you're not. Because God is really interested in a house for himself. God is interested in temples. You know, somebody's going to quote me, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Of course, you know, he actually did dwell in a temple made with hands. And he left it too, by the way. I said last night, Ichabod, you know. Uh, Ich means uh, departed. And uh, Kabod means glory. It's a uh, Hebrew word. Kabod. Kabod means glory. Ichabod, glory departed. But uh, I know, you know, God doesn't exactly dwell at First Baptist or St. Mary's uh, or uh, St. George, you know. He in a, there's a sense in which he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, but when we read this thing in Revelation 21 and 22, this is not a temple made with hands. It's a temple made by God uh, out of people. Okay, but God is interested in a temple. And I will show you that tonight. I'll show you how interested he is. God wants a house. Now, most people, when they want a house, they build one or they buy one. That's what you do. And we're made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God is one reason why we want a house. If 
Father John and Mary Ellen have wanted several houses. You know, we've moved. We've probably moved more than Walker. I don't know. But we've moved 40 times in 48 years of being married. And we've owned about maybe three or four houses. I mean, made payments on three or four houses. I don't know if we owned them. But uh, uh, you know, your house is really important to you. My house is really important to me. My house is a special place. It's where I dwell. It's where I live. It's where I'm secure. It's where I'm safe. It's where mom's safe. It's where Dan, Judy, uh, Gary and Melissa, Tim and Sue, Tom and Wendy and Peter and their kids, it's where they come when they come to see grandma and grandpa. My home is extremely important to me. My home is a sacred place. You don't just do anything at my home. You don't even come to my home and be presumptuous. It's my house. There's places in my house you don't go. Because you're not invited to, to certain places in my home. Because I don't want you to see the mess, number one. <laughs> and number two, there's just places in my home that are private. Now, I don't want to get too far into that. But I want you to see why God wants a home tonight. I'm going to show you that from the scriptures. Uh, and it's also why Orthodox churches are built the way they are, because Orthodox churches are built for God to be His house. I mean, His house in heaven, not His house on earth. They're, they're built for that. Uh, you know, I don't have anything inherently against uh, uh, of these long churches. I, w I was at the mission in Santa Barbara one day. I lived in Santa Barbara for 25 years. And if I live long enough, I'll probably retire in Santa Barbara. But I went down to the mission in Santa Barbara, and you've been down there to the mission, and it looks like a bowling alley. I mean, it's, it's long and narrow, and you wonder, the poor guy sitting in the back row, what did he, couldn't hear anything. Uh, no, the, an Orthodox church is actually built, uh, it's built to show heaven. Uh, you know, that's why we have the iconostas there. And, you know, that's where heaven and earth meet. You know, who attends the service? Who's going to be in church Sunday? I don't know if you're going to be in church Sunday, because some of you are going to skip on Sunday. But Mary's not going to skip. Gabriel's not going to skip. Michael the Archangel's not going to skip. They, they seem to go to every Orthodox service. Jesus is sure going to be there. We're going to, we're going to you know, uh, uh, I don't know if your priest does this out loud or silently, but he does it. You know, it is meet and right to him, you to bless you, to praise you, to worship you in every place of your dominion, except Sunday at St. Basil's, but it's pretty close to that. <laughs> but that's all addressed to the Father. You know, the big prayer in the middle of the liturgy. That's all addressed to the Father. It's not addressed to the Son or the Holy Spirit. It's addressed to the Father, the big middle prayer in the, in the whole liturgy. And uh, heaven and earth are going to meet there, except it's actually heaven. Earth sort of meets heaven there. And in, in, in a mystery, uh, we, heaven and earth meet, and when we go to heaven, you know, uh, uh, Jesus and the woman at the well, uh, you know, the woman says, Our Father say that Jerusalem is the place, uh, and, and we... Uh, you say Jerusalem, and we say this place in Samaria is the place. What do you say? And uh, he says, it's neither here nor in Jerusalem. God is the spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's the way our churches are built the way they are, so that because we, we assume we're worshiping him in spirit. Okay, so what we're after is a house. Tonight, that's where we're, New Jerusalem is what I'm going to show you is that New Jerusalem is a temple. It's a temple with a temple in it. It's a temple within a temple. The temple that's within the temple is the Lord Himself. It says the Lord God and the Lamb are its temple. But the whole the city itself is a temple. And it's built out of the people of God. Now, I'm a priest in a relatively new parish. Uh, San Diego is a very expensive place to build. Uh, it's, not as, it's, it's probably not all that much more expensive to build than here. The land is very expensive. For us to build in San Diego, it costs us roughly somewhere between a million and a million and a half an acre. And you need at least three acres to build a church. So we're talking about three million dollars just for a piece of land. And, you know, it takes a while to get to the place where you can buy a chunk of land for three million and then you're going to put about four or five more million uh, just to build a basic structure. So, you know, you're looking for about seven million dollars. And, and even if your church is in La Jolla, California, uh, we 
which is a, you know, sort of an upscale, affluent community. That's not the easiest thing to do. So let's, let me tell you what I do on Sunday, a couple of things I do that bother me. Number one, I stand at the altar. And the altar I stand at is a piece of plywood. It's a piece of four by eight plywood that's cut in half. And it's notched. One half of it is notched so that one of the uh, pieces notches over the other that holds a base up. And then the other part, another four, five, four by four piece of it, sits on top. That's my altar. It's got a pretty cloth on it. But it's not a consecrated altar. And it gets pushed around. And the Episcopalians use, our, use the facility during the week. And the Newman Club, the Roman Catholic student work, they use it during the week. And then there's a half a dozen other groups that might use it during the week. And, uh, and uh, they, they used to have yoga classes in there. And frankly, it was embarrassing to me to have yoga classes in front of Michael, Gabriel, uh, St. Anthony, John the Baptist, and the Lord and his mom. Uh, and I, I was a little, I was honestly fearful for the people in the yoga class. I'm not against the yoga class, but I just don't think it's appropriate to be doing the stuff in front of uh, those heavenly persons. Uh, didn't, they didn't seem to be bothered by it. I was bothered by it because I didn't think it was appropriate. Nothing I could do about it at all. And so here I, I have this... Uh, uh, we, our service meets. Some of you have been. Two or three of you have been to a service. Uh, Doug and Cheryl, you've been there. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a nice hall. But the church isn't consecrated. The altar's not consecrated. Eh, the iconostas is okay. It's a... I'll tell you how my, my iconostas got built. And it'll sort of... It'll help you tonight understand where I'm going. Um... I used to work in missions and evangelism like Father Gordon does, and my job was to plant churches. So the last church I did before St. Anthony in San Diego was uh, St. Stephen in San Jose, or Cupertino, which is right next door. And uh, <clears throat> we were having a, a service one morning, it was probably about our sixth or seventh liturgy that we had there. And uh, a young guy was there in his mid-twenties, and, uh, and it was probably his second time that he'd been there, and I, I knew his name. His, um, his name was Skip Sharp. Uh, and uh, he came up to me afterwards. Now, we, we met in an Armenian church. It was a very lovely church. And we met in this Armenian church, and, and our service was at 8, and had to be over at 9.30, and by 9.30, we had to get cleaned up, get everything done so the Armenians could meet. They, they had their service at 10. It was their church, so we just had to fit. Well, so Skip came up to me, uh, and, you know, this was the second time he'd been in an Orthodox church. And he said, Father, I see you have a problem. And because we were taking easels down, you know, and, and icons and moving everything, and, you know, Orthodox have more hardware than you can shake a stick at. You know, and so here we were hauling all this stuff down. And he said, Father, I build theater equipment. I build uh, theater sets for a living. I think I know what you need. And I'll build you an iconostats that you can put up and take down in five minutes. And he did. Now it's been added to a little bit. It's still going down it can be put up in 10 minutes. Actually, it looks rather nice, doesn't it? And you can get one if you want, by the way. He builds, he's built several more now. He builds them uh, for many churches. But you know, it's not really what I'm after. It's not really what I want. When my wife and I first got married, we lived in a very small one-bedroom apartment. Uh, that was built in a garage. It was a garage, converted. And you know, that was just really fine for John and Mary Ellen Braun. But by the time uh, John and Mary Ellen Braun had, Braun had five children, a one-bedroom, a garage apartment, really wasn't appropriate. That we needed a house, and we needed room for 
kids. If you're going to have five kids, you better have a little room for them. If I thought I were going to stay at St. Anthony for the rest of my life, which may not last very long, but it may, we buried my father on his 100th birthday, uh, literally. Uh, if I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life playing port at church, I'd probably quit. Uh, I'm determined to build a building. Do you know why I want to build a building? Because I know God's in the building. Because that's what He's doing. Now here's how we're going to do it. On the last night of the Last Supper, Jesus is with the disciples. They were sad. They knew something was wrong. And so Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now how is he going to comfort them? His goal is to give them comfort. How did he comfort them? In my Father's house. Did you hear it? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I'm going, you know, and away you know, and so on. In my Father's house. I go to prepare a place. Prepare a place other than his Father's house? No! To build the Father's house. There's a building taking place. I'm using building as a verb right now. There's a building taking place. God is building. What's he building out of? He's building out of precious stones. What are the precious stones? It's not what are the precious stones. It's who are the precious stones. You are the precious stones. Building what? Building a house. A house for whom? It's God's house. It's where he dwells. It's where he lives. Where does God live? Imagine Israel in the wilderness at the Exodus. Imagine them out there after the tabernacle was built. You know, they were camped on all four sides of the tabernacle. Where did God dwell? You can answer me out loud. Where did God dwell? I'll take several answers. Where did he dwell? What? Where did he dwell? He dwelt, but, and geographically, where did he dwell? In the Holy of Holies. Where was that? Right smack dab in the middle. He dwelt in the midst of them. Okay. Now, last night we talked about the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven from God. And I read to you last night from 1 Peter chapter 2. And this is what I read. And coming to him as a living stone rejected by men, choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, a spiritual house. Whose spiritual house? God's house. Is it different from in my Father's house are many mansions? It's the same thing. What do you think? God has, you know, a summer home, a winter home, a, a home in South Heaven, North Heaven, on the coast in Heaven. There's no sea in Heaven, by the way. <laughs> there's a river, but there's not a sea. That's what it says. I saw a new Heaven and a new Earth. The old Heaven and the first Earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. I don't know what that means. I know what I can guess it means. Being built up into a spiritual house... Spiritual house for what? For a holy priesthood. I was taught as a child that there's no that, the, that a priesthood is wrong. I was taught that God's priesthood, all believers are the priest. And there should be no priest. It's not a very biblical doctrine. Maybe needed at the time. I happen to like Martin Luther very well. I actually like John Calvin fairly well. And I love uh, uh, John Wesley who came later. Uh, Charles Wesley, kind of like Earl Wick Swingley, uh, but I was a Swinglin, so I don't like him very well anymore, because <laughs> he was wrong on a lot of stuff. Uh, he was very anti-church uh, in many ways. He was against God's house, though he never left, he never left the Catholic Church, actually. 
I uh, just got a lot of other people to live, of which I happen to be one of the inheritors. Because my family, <coughs> I come from a family that are called Anabaptist. My parents were Anabaptists. That means to rebaptize. Uh, it, what it, but what it meant was is that you blew out of the established church and became renegades, Christian renegades. And, uh, you know, there's people today that think it's really cool to be Christian renegades. It's my heritage. Uh, that's what I came from, my family, by nature. Uh, we got chased all over Europe. We got chased into, the, into Russia. We got chased out of Russia. We got chased into Canada and volitionally came to the United States. My family was very persecuted. Uh, you know what they did to Anabaptists? Uh, the, 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 both the, both the, the, the Catholics and the Reformers, both of them, they said, Oh, you want to be rebaptized, do you? Well, we'd be glad to accommodate you. We will rebaptize you. The only problem was they held them under for about 30 minutes. <laughs> they did. You've seen some of the stuff that was done to the Anabaptists. You've been over there in Switzerland, in, uh, where a lot of the persecution took place. Oh, they did some terrible things. I mean, both the Protestants and the Catholics did some really bad things to the Anabaptists. I imagine we deserve some of it, but not that way. There's an old friend of Father Gordon's. I'm teasing. His name was Balthazar Hubmeyer. He was a very famous Anabaptist, by the way. Probably a pretty good man. They drowned his wife. They said, well, we baptize you. They did. They just drowned her. And they drowned thousands. Uh, at any rate, why did I get off there? It's your fault. You led me astray. One of you did. I don't know which one of you. At any rate, we build a new house to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Uh, uh oh, the priesthood of the believer. That's where I got into this. Uh, there, there does need to be a priesthood. There has always, there was a priesthood in the Old Testament. There's a priesthood in the New Testament. You know who the high priest is? Jesus. Uh, but there are priests. There's one. Here's one. <coughs> there are many. Uh, where, you know, by the way, uh, do you know why, do you know why the Orthodox priest stands on the side of the altar he stands on? Do you know why he stands in front of the altar? Not to be a mediator between you and God. You see, we all face the same way. See, the priest faces the same way as the people. It's not a matter of the priest standing in front of you as though he's... Now, if the... I'll tell you who the priests are. It's the guy who stands between uh, and facing you. Uh, no, he stands, I stand, all Orthodox priests stand facing the same way the people do towards God. God's up front... And, uh, and we're coming out from there. That's not a small thing, by the way. Uh, okay, a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices uh, for a holy priesthood acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for this is contained in Scripture. And then, yes, the church is a holy priesthood, and that's, by the way, why you've got to stop not participating in the divine liturgy. I'm in a mean mood tonight. I am tired of Orthodox Christians who tell me they don't need to participate in the liturgy. And if you don't participate, you need to start. It isn't he that offers it. It isn't I that offers it. We offer it. The whole thing is done by all of us together. It's a dialogue. It's something that takes place. It's a harmony that takes place between, uh, uh, to be blunt, it takes place between the priest and and the, and the choir, and the people. It's something that we all do together. And everyone plays a part. Some people don't like choirs. I like choirs. There's a dialogue between the priest and the choir, but I expect that dialogue also from the people. And when, when you say, Lord of mercy, or Yadaburam, or Kiri Eleison, or whatever you say, uh, you need to say it. Don't just let some chanter wimp it out. You get so tired of it. Yeah, that boy. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Who's praying? The priest by himself? For the peace of the whole world, the good estate of the holy churches of God, and for the union of all? We pray that prayer, and you don't say anything. What do you think we're doing? And then we wonder.
wonder why people wonder if Orthodox Christians are serious. I mean, can you think of a much more serious prayer than the peace of the whole world, the good estate of the holy churches of God, and the union of all men, and we just stand there like we're dumb? What's the prayer to pray? Lord have mercy. What do you, what do the Russians say? Uh, yeah. No. Well, we need to say it. I mean, come on. Uh, it, it's a, it's a harmony. It's the people of God working together. It's worship of the living God. Where? In heaven. You don't think the angels stand there and don't say anything, do you? Uh, you know, do you know what's happening? You know, a lot of stuff goes on in heaven at the same time. <laughs> do you know what the angels are doing while we're doing uh, Lord of Mercy? They're doing holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. That's what they do. That's pretty good, huh? They participate. Heaven does its job. Earth sometimes doesn't do its job very well. You know, there's probably some reasons. Probably it got into choirs and the people probably got discouraged because they couldn't sing the choir music. I can. Uh, but I can sure do, I can sure do Lord have mercy. I can sure do Kiri Elias and I can sure do into your spirit. You know what's really discouraging for a priest? Peace be to all. Into your spirit. When I say peace be to all, I expect you to say. And to your spirit. Yes. What do you think I said peace be to all for? Just because I want to show you I can do it? No. I mean, I need peace to my spirit, especially tonight, huh? <laughs> you know, I figured I might as well get all the mileage I can out of this tonight. Because that's what God wants. In heaven, everyone participates. If you go to heaven, you participate. You don't sit there dumb, and I mean dumb in the sense of silence. You participate. And some of you say, well, gee, it's really hard in my church because I'd be the only one. Well, start building. You know, something funny happens. I'm in the Antiochian Archdiocese, which most of you know, and we have a place called Antiochian Village. And we had a priest there when it first started by the name of Father John Maney. One of the most unusual men I've ever known. Died recently. I mean, he had a voice that would nail you to the wall. And he would not tolerate the kids of the village not singing. And any of you ever go to a village when Father John was there? Do you remember? He would stand at the altar and pound out the music on the altar and make you sing. And kids would go home from Antiochian village and they would never again in their life be satisfied with not singing. They'd go back to their churches and you'd hear these feeble little kids' voices, Lord have mercy, God of you know. they, They'd go back because never again were they satisfied to not participate. Father John got them into the liturgy. He got them into the services. Well, one reason is why is because God wants you to do it. It isn't just the priest Gordon or the priest John or the priest whomever. It's God who wants you to do it. He wants that participation because this is taking place in his house. He's the host. You're the guest. You do what the host asks. That's He called you for dinner. By the way, as long as I'm on that one too. When God invites you to dinner, don't show up late. It's not nice. He invites you to dinner. Revelation chapter 20, uh, Revelation chapter 3, a very misquoted verse. It's a verse that's quoted often. It's okay, I guess, but it's a verse that's quoted to get people to invite Jesus into their hearts. It's okay. But that's not what the context is. Behold, Jesus says to the people of Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. Now, what door is he standing on? Be careful. Don't answer unless you know for sure the answer. Do you know what door he's knocking on? 
It's not the door of your heart. If you read Revelation chapter 3, the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he's knocking on the door of the church at Laodicea. And when he says, I will come in and sup, how? Well, communion. That's what he's talking about. It's a communion verse. It's a Eucharistic verse. That's what it's about. He says, I'll come in, I'll, I'll meet you at your Eucharist. I'll be there for the Thanksgiving. Eucharisto, that's what it means, Thanksgiving. I'll be in there. We'll have dinner together. Because what does God, what did I do? Oh, we can't miss a precious word. Wait a minute, we've got to stop everything. Temperamental mind. Oh, hey, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know, there's many times in the Bible when it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven. <laughs> this ain't heaven. <laughs> but I sure do have a loud voice. <laughs> One time I was working with a couple of choir directors and talking to them about leading music. And they said, Father John, you, you don't have lungs, you've got bellows. <laughs> uh, I think they were right. But my point, I don't want to be lost. When God invites you to his home, to his house for dinner, folks, come on time. It's not stylish to be late for God. You take it to heart, I'm dead serious. I remember going to a church one Sunday morning. It was a church that was very large, I mean relatively large. I, I figured it would hold roughly a thousand, maybe eight hundred. And, uh, and when we started the Divine Liturgy, there were 30 people. I counted them. I counted them. 30 people. And when we got to the little entrance, there were probably 100. And when we got to the great entrance, there were probably 400. And by the time the service was over, there was standing room only. I think it's an insult. If I were God, I'd say, I'm not sure I want you back at my house. If you can't come when I invited you, why did you come? He just, I mean, we need manners in the house of God. You know, it's, and, and the same people say, well, you don't chew gum, you don't cross your legs. <laughs> but they can come late. You know, and we call it Arabic time, or we call it Greek time. Except we get to school and work at the right time. Arabs and Greeks get to work at the right time. We just can't get to church at the right time. We need to get to church at the right time. Well, uh, I want to take you to another scripture, because I want to show you God's in the houses. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, <clears throat> we'll get close to verse 19. I'll get some context here. Uh, well, I don't want to get too much context. I'll start at verse 17. And he came uh, and preached peace to you who were near, this is Jesus, and who were far away, and peace to those who were near, that's Jew and Gentile, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer, he's speaking to the Gentiles now, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Father Gordon actually dealt with this today in the afternoon. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. See, God's interested in a household. Having been built, now those of you who were last here last night, answer, get ready to answer my question. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone, where did you hear that? Well, you heard that last night in Revelation chapter 21, didn't you? Foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We're not through yet. Now this is God's house. In whom... The whole building, what building? Church. God's house, the church, the whole building being fitted and held together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. The difference in the way we build and the way God builds is He just builds out of living stones. We build out of brick and mortar. He builds out of living stones. But what he's after is a house. Okay, that's all I'm going to take from that one. 
uh, if you have a Bible, you can look with me at 1 Corinthians, um, uh, do I want that one? Yeah, we'll take it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, we will start roughly at um, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know? This is pretty powerful stuff. Do you? I mean, he's asking like, can you be so dumb that you don't know? I mean, that's the context here. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. You are what? You are the temple. God is building for himself a building. <clears throat> Uh, let me take you, as long as we're in, uh, in the Corinthians, let's take 2 Corinthians for a minute. This one we've got to be a tiny bit careful with, but I'm going to take it anyway. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, we're going to start with uh, verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, are you ready for the next statement? Eternal in the heavens. Eternal is a fairly long time. Now, that's just, I just contradicted, didn't I? Because you can't say long time with eternal. Eternal in the heavens. And indeed, in this house, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, shall not be found naked. Now, well, I'll finish. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that is what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. The reason I say we got to be a little careful with this is because this one floats back and forth a little bit because part of this seems to refer to your physical body as being this mortal tent. But it's not contradictory because he says we are to put on a house or a temple that is immortal. Now, would you tell me what is it this is an incorrect question, but it's a trick question. What is it that the Christian puts on? Christ. Yes. It isn't really what does the Christian put on. It's who does the Christian put on. We put on Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a temple. It is God's house. The cornerstone of the house is Jesus. Jesus. The foundation of the house is, Jesus. or the twelve, the foundation stones, are the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the city itself is made out of whom? Living stones. Who are we? We are the living stones. Remarkable. Now, that's why you put off this earthly tent, and that's a pretty rotten earthly tent, right? I mean, I'm not kidding. This tent's falling apart. Uh, you know, it's got a shattered roof. Well, the roof's still pretty good. It's just what's under the roof, so getting a little bit shaggy. Uh, he creaks and groans, and, you know, he does. He's got some of his pieces don't work right, especially the joints and the bones and stuff. And the doctors love to cut on him. But as many as have been baptiz baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know, isn't, it, isn't this exciting? Now listen to me. If I were to say to you, now you better be right on this. See, if you participated in the liturgy, no one would flunk this. As many as have, put on, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What are the next three words? 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, why? That's a big deal. If you have put on Christ, you, there's about one appropriate word. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! I put on Christ. Is there anything better you can put on? You're clothed in immortality. You're clothed in humanity. By the way, what does it mean to put on Christ? I'll tell you what it means to put on Christ. It means to put on His glorified humanity. You cannot put on divine nature in and of its own essence. Otherwise, the Trinity wouldn't be a Trinity. It would be a fraternity or whatever, an umptity. Uh, and we, we do not... We do not possess the, the divine nature as such uh, in, its, in, its, in its essence. We put on the divine energy, uh, 2 Peter 1.4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and pro precious promises, that by these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And how do we put that, that on? Because in Christ... Uh, most of you have heard this, but not all of you have, and it's worth stopping here for a minute. But, but you know, the, we were joking about the, the cover. Where's my, anybody have a copy of that Divine Energy? Uh, really handy. You know, uh, uh, we were talking about the cover on it, I think, reeks, you know. Uh, it's, I don't know who did the, the disservice, but I think this is just a really bad cover. I don't even like the colors on it. Uh, what it used to have on it was, it was also a little weird, but it had a sword and a fire. That's what it had on it. And the reason it had the sword, and it wasn't my idea either, by the way. I didn't have anything to do with the cover. I did do what was inside. But the whole idea, if you heat a sword in a fire, what will happen to the sword? It gets hot. It takes on the energy of the fire. Now, does, be careful unless you're a physicist or unless you're really sure of the answer. What happens to the fire? Does the fire lose any energy? No. I've checked with physicists on this. No. The fire does not lose any energy. The sword simply participates in the energy of the fire. And this is how, this is how the fathers of the church spoke about this. What happens to us is that by being brought into union with Jesus Christ in His glorified humanity, we participate in... Uh, he is... His human nature is the sword, and His divine nature is the fire, and His human nature is energized by His divine nature. And when you come into union with Christ... In his divine nature, you participate in that energizing. So when you put on Christ, you put on divine energy. That's what the book is about. You put that on, but you're putting on Christ. You're clothed with him, but being clothed with him puts you in a temple. It puts you as a living stone in the temple. Well, that's enough for... Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. We're, we're not through yet. Uh, let's take... Uh, let's take... This is an interesting one. This is kind of a fun one. Revelation chapter 3. I kind of... Th this, is, this is just... It's a... I don't think it's a twist. Now, you remember we read last night in Revelation chapter 21 about who overcomes? Well, in Revelation... Uh, chapter 3 uh, in verse 12 here's what he says <clears throat> St. John uh, I like the verse before 11 I am coming quickly hold fast what you have in order that no one may take away your crown he who overcomes doesn't get his crown taken away he who overcomes I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God Wow! I'll make him a pillar. By the way, that's where the expression comes from that someone was a pillar of the church. That's where the whole idea got started. 
I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Uh, now, now, we're not through with that yet. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write upon him the name of my, of my God, in the name of the city of my God. Are you ready? In the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, and my new name, Jesus, my, it refers to him. Wow. Now, some of those living stones are pillars. Uh, you remember the gates? What were they made out of? Well, we talk about the pearly gates all the time. We take that from this passage, from that passage. Well, we talk about pillars in the church. What kind of pillars are they? Only one answer tonight. Living pillars. Living pillars. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And I'll write upon him the name of my city, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven from God. A pillar in a temple, God's house. You see, it's consistent. It all fits together. Well, uh, I think I want to take one more because there's something important here. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, this one is terribly important. It has to do with the way we behave. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, I'm going to start at verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Don't, uh, that is, do not be united together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch the unclean thing, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And the last part of that passage I've known by heart since I was a little tiny kid. I memorized it when I was very young, but I did not grasp the part, what agreement has the... Now he, he builds these parallels here. Let's just take the parallels once again. Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? That's one set. What fellowship has light with darkness? That's a second set. What harmony has Christ with Belial? And, and Belial is, sort of, is a demonic thing. Or what does a believer have in, have in common with an unbeliever? That's the fourth set. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? That's the fifth set. But what does he mean when he says the temple? For you, for we are the temple of the living God. We are God's house. It's in the process of being built. Those of you who are into the internet, into the, into the world wide web, how many times have you gone to a website where there was a little piece that said uh, in, the, in the process of being built. I'm a relatively high-tech priest. Father Gordon can't even turn the computer on. Uh, I'm surrounded by, I love computers and I've been into them for about 20 years. And uh, I mess with them almost every day. And uh, by the way, you, if you, if you want to be just energized, uh, uh, www.site-anthony.org uh, You can even hear sermons uh, by Father John at st-anthony.org uh, I have a guy that's built a great set. But uh, in, in the building process, the church, the temple of the living God is in the building process. That is what God is doing today. Now, I'm going to be very careful here because I do not want to offend anyone other than those I've already offended. Evangelism is not God's number one priority. It's a priority. It's not number one. 
Teaching is not God's number one priority. Building God's house is God's priority. To do that, we evangelize. To do that, we teach. To do that, we worship. But the house is built. The house is not built, folks, for evangelism. It is not built for teaching. It is built for... Worship. And what kind of worship? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. There is really only one basic sacrifice that is acceptable, which is Jesus. Father John Finley, when he was in Nashville with Father Gordon, many years ago, when we were on our journey to orthodoxy, wrote a beautiful song, a communion hymn, which I wish we could still sing. What acceptable sacrifice can we offer to God? Nothing. Nothing but Jesus. He's the once for all sacrifice. We enter into that. That's what you do on Sunday morning. That's what you do in the divine liturgy. Not just the priest. Everybody, we enter into that once for all sacrifice. The only thing that is acceptable to God. How do you get born again? Sean Stacy raised the question last night. It's through Jesus we get that new birth. It's through Jesus we get regeneration. It's through Jesus we get forgiveness of sins. It's through Jesus we get access to God. It's His offering. It's His sacrifice to God. And we, we offer that to Him. We who have been baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. We're part of that building. We're living stones. We're in it. And it's that we participate in this. Offering to God the only thing that is acceptable, or without whom nothing else is acceptable. Oh, I know we sing in Vespers, let the lifting up of my hands be an evening sacrifice. But, you know, just getting your hands in the air not, doesn't do anything good but get your shoulders sore unless you're lifting up your hands to the Lord. Who is the acceptable sacrifice? God is in the business of building. Now, to start to wind this down. This is what the church is about in this age. The church in this age is to get ready for eternity. It is not going to be a new church. You know, heaven and earth are going to pass away. I may touch on that tomorrow night. I may touch on what it means when it says... I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth have passed away and there's no longer any sea. I mean, everything's going to fry, folks. I'm not sure if fry is the right word. It's probably a worse word. It says they melt. They melt with a fervent heat. I may deal with some of that tomorrow night. But tonight, oh boy, this that is being built, this has to do with eternity. What you have to do with in the church has to do with eternity. This is for good. This is not temporary stuff. This isn't to get you through until you die. This is to, you will continue. <clears throat> I suppose I lived until I was in my 50s with uh, the, 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 uh, the, just sort of the, the default understanding that when you died, you got thrown out of the church. I mean, you know, you no longer had it, you, you know, you're done. And, uh, you know, we had this little doctrine, we had the church triumphant and the church militant. We were talking about this morning with a friend of ours. Uh, hey, there's just one church. And the line between, uh, the line between heaven and earth, the line between the departed in the Lord and, the, and those living in the Lord is a very, very, very thin when we read in Ephesians chapter 2 from the whole from whom the whole body fit and held together um, this is chapter 4 I'm sorry from whom the whole body being fit and held together by that which every joint supplies 
according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love, everybody in heaven still has his or her part to play in the body. People say to us who are Orthodox, what do you pray for the departed for? Because they're in our church. How do we know they pray for us? Because they obey Jesus. Well, how do I know Jesus wants it done? Well, I have to do is read Ephesians chapter 6. It says, praying always with all prayer and watching there too with all perseverance for all the saints. I'll tell you who prayed for me more than anybody else on the face of this earth. Finest Christian I've ever known in my life, barring none. My mom. My mom was a remarkable person. I never heard anything come out of her mouth that was not appropriate. My mother suffered every day of my life. My mother accepted that. And my mom prayed for Johnny. Do you think that Linda Brown would say when she departed to be with the Lord, thank God I don't have to pray for my kid anymore. My mother was burdened in her prayers for me because of physical suffering. Once she got to glory with Jesus, she's not suffered. She doesn't have to suffer with the pain anymore. She hasn't had a heart attack since she died, but she had nine that I know of on this earth. Most people don't have nine heart attacks, do they? I'd go home from school and the, the women in the church would be at my house. I finally figured out what that meant. That meant my mom had had another heart attack. I remember it. Not once, twice, five. I remember it. She had several strokes. She just kept living. She, should have, she lived to 60. She should have died a lot sooner. She was 32 when I was born. I was part of the problem. She was the solution. You think she doesn't pray for me? You think your departed loved ones do not pray for you? We pray for each other. What a dumb idea to think we only pray for those who are still alive. What a dumb idea to think that those who are in the house of God don't pray for each other when the Lord says pray for each other. They're the ones that are the most, the ones that are departed are more obedient than we who are here. We want to be obedient, but sometimes we get stubborn. We also get intimidated. Someone comes along and says, what do you pray for the departed for? Now, all we pray basically is grant them rest with the light of your countenance shines and may their memory be eternal. I can't think of anything I want more than to be in God's memory eternally. I, if I'm in God's memory eternally, I'm in a great spot. If God doesn't remember me, I'm in trouble. We pray for each other. Those in the household of God, that's part of our sacrifice, even our prayers. Let my prayer arise in your sight as incense, in the lifting up of my hands, be an evening sacrifice. You see, don't be embarrassed or ashamed that you're an Orthodox Christian. We just do the stuff that Jesus commanded. And unfortunately, we do some stuff or fail to do some stuff that he wants us to do. We need to shore up on some of that stuff, folks. We're not perfect by a long, long way. But what God is doing with us is building himself a house. I don't know who else is in the house, and I don't presume to guess. Not for a minute would I guess. I know, who's part, I know we're part of the house. You know, Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. I have no idea who all that might be. My mom wasn't orthodox until she got to heaven. She didn't even know there was such a thing. My father didn't get orthodox until he got there. And the first thing that happened to him is he met the mother of God and said, oh, I'm sorry, I am so sorry that I didn't believe the truth about you. Because my father was wrong about Mary. I mean, as a Protestant, he was wrong about Mary. I mean, he was, even amongst Protestant, Protestants, he was heretical. Because the Mennonites have a heresy. And that, that Jesus really wasn't one of us. Now, that, that Mary had a divine ovum from heaven that was implanted in her. Divine ovum, divine sperm. 
which means Jesus really wasn't one of us at all. He was just some other kind of creature, but not in his humanity, not ours. Ours didn't get saved. That's the logic of it. They didn't mean that, but they were, they were mad at the Roman Catholics about Mary, and maybe they had a beef. It's legitimate. They did it wrong. But my father, my father prays too. You think he, he prayed for his son all his life? The sun rose and set on John. You're dead. My father lived his life in his son. My father used to love to go to those big crusade meetings. He was so proud and so delighted. He didn't like it when I became orthodox. Today he prays for me. Tonight he prays for me. This is what we do in the temple of the living God, the household of God. You want to be a part of God's house, don't you? So where's my punchline tonight? Very simple. <clears throat> Taking all this into account. If you go between Vespers, I mean between uh, Matins and Divine Liturgy, here's what you will find. Remembering our most holy, most pure, most blessed and glorious lady, the Theotokos, the Mother of God, and ever Virgin Mary, let us commend or commit. The word means the same thing, folks. Sometimes we like to say command to avoid commit. It means the same thing. You can translate that Greek word as either commit or command. Let us commit ourselves and each other and all our life. Now, there's a punchline coming here. And all our life under Christ our God. In many translations, here's how it reads. In fact, most translations. Remembering our most holy, most pure, and most blessed and glorious Lady, the Mother of God, and ever Virgin Mary, with all the saints, let us commit ourselves and each other and all our lives unto Christ our God. In the Greek text of the liturgy, it does not say life. Lives. It says life. Do you know why it says life? Because there's just one life. It's the one that we've put on. It's Jesus. He is our life. From the life-giving Spirit, He is our life. He is the Father's gift of life to us. And we have put Him on. So what's our response to that? Why is it? That's why we're the household. That's why we're the temple. That's why we are these things. Let us commit ourselves and each other, and all our life, unto Christ our God. What you need to do. <laughs> you know, once in a while somebody says, you know, you were the dogs. You, you never ask anybody to you make a commitment to Christ. No, just seven times every Sunday morning. Just at the end of every single litany. Everyone! Not only commit ourselves, but each other. Doesn't that make you feel good about your children, Mary Sue? That you can commit them to? Doesn't it make you feel good about your neighbors? Doesn't it make you feel good about those who sit next to you in liturgy? They may be sleeping, but you can commit them to. Let us commit ourselves and each other. That's biblical, by the way. And all our life unto Christ our God. That's the response. So I quit for tonight. Please help us if you're right. All right. Now, if you want to ask Father John a question, start off with my yeah, my. Father John, you were reading tonight from uh, Revelation. Why do a lot of Orthodox priests, whether they're Greek or Antiochian, avoid Revelations? And why is it so fearful that it's discussed? Well, it's, you know, uh, Father Hopko, number one, has done a great deal on the book of Revelation. And he's got some really, by the way, he's got some video. Does he have video? I think so. But I know he has audio tape, but I think it's also video. Some people have done it. It's worth listening to, by the way. It is true that we do not read ever in the public reading in the church. We never read the book of Revelation. There is a very good reason for that, because it is, there's so much controversy that has been engendered over the years. We never discourage the private reading of the book of Revelation. By the way, most of you only hear small pieces of the Bible. That makes me sad, too. You know, we only read about 42 Gospels a year because so many are repeats, because we read the same account 
And, uh, you know, the way the readings are set up is, uh, you know, there's, you be, ought to be reading every day, and then you'd get them all read. Uh, the, the, the truth is, is that there's nothing against preaching on it. There, there has been so much controversy, especially in America. Uh, the, uh, you know, the Tim LaHaye, uh, the Left Behind series. I've read two or three of them. You know, you say, is it right or wrong? Probably wrong. Is it helpful to some? Uh, but there was a professor at St. Vladimir's, an old Russian professor, who just honestly, he was a bishop, who actually wasn't that very far away from that. He just wasn't all that far away from that. Would I call it heresy? No. Would I call it true? I don't know. Uh, it's, you know, it's interesting. How many of you have read any of the Left Behind? That's interesting. Uh, it's huge. It's huge. Uh, in, in the reading. Though interestingly enough, in a George Barna survey, uh, very few people were aware of the book even though it sold millions of the, the series, millions and millions of copies. Nothing wrong with it. I think some priests uh, uh, just, they're, they're apprehensive. And especially what happens is that people in our parishes go to, to a Bible study where someone is teaching a very dispensational, and most of you don't understand that word, and, and thank God you don't. But they, uh, we, we're very aware of it. They, they're exposed to a very dispensational type teaching, and it gets incredibly controversial. It's a very academic uh, scheme that originally was built strictly on the King James Version of the Bible, and even at that it didn't fit. There are several major schools in America that are absolutely committed to it, though most of them backed away somewhat in the last years. Moody Bible Institute, Dallas Theological Seminary, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, where my parents met uh, when they were 18. And, uh, and, and the, the controversy just rages so much, and then the priest gets accosted by someone who went to one of these Bible studies, and he's intimidated because he doesn't know this system. Well, I mean, you've got to have charts across the front of your church a mile long. Uh, I'm not kidding you. I have seen charts longer than that across the front of churches uh, on this scheme of teaching that so many of the uh, particularly of the, there's some very prominent women Bible teachers in America, and many of them, you still use this scheme. So, there's, there's nothing wrong with it, and uh, as I say, uh, Father Hopko has taught many, many, many times he's taught on it, and, and many other priests have done it. The truth is, uh, do you know why most of us don't? Do you know how much, we, uh, Dan figured this out, he, he hit it for me tonight. Do you know how much teaching the average Orthodox Christian gets in a year if they tend to go to church? Do you know how many hours, Dan, how many hours? Four hours, Father. Four hours. Four hours a year. That's assuming a ten-minute sermon. And how many times a month going to church? Twice, Father. Twice a month and a ten-minute sermon. Four hours. You got that this weekend. You said, you better believe we did. We're aware of every minute of it. So, but when would we do it? There's things that are more important. There really are. I realize that uh, the, the theme of tonight is, is about building, God building the temple of itself. Yet allow me please to ask a question about some comments that you made that may be not related to the main topic itself. Uh, is it possible that in the New Testament there is two kinds of priesthood, a private priesthood, so to speak, and a general priesthood of all the believers? When we look at Peter, the reference in Second Peter is definitely implying, at least in my mind, that it's for all the believers that in some way we are priests unto Jesus Christ. Our that priest. is a true statement. That is an orthodox dogma. Okay. And there's also... Uh, the New Testament is also very clear on uh, the great high priest and those who are under the great high priest, the chief shepherd, and those under the chief shepherd. The New Testament has the whole thing. I would never belittle a priesthood. Uh, the, we are all together a priesthood. There is, that is a dogma. Uh, that's not up for grabs. But, to, but then to dismiss the clergy... Uh, and say there is that the, the priest should not be a priest; that he's 
I don't stand between you and God. Uh, we stand together. Second question. Uh, you, when you mentioned dispensationalism, you, felt, you, you said that uh, maybe it's good that you don't know what it is. Please allow me respectfully to, to disagree that I think, I happen to think that maybe God is bringing back orthodoxy in America for a purpose, that maybe we have a role to bring some sanity to some of the theological understanding that have gone way too far. And I think that it's important for us Orthodox, especially that we don't get enough teaching in our churches to be aware with what's going on outside. Now at that point I wouldn't say you're respectfully disagreeing with me, I would say that you were respectfully agreeing with me. One of my great greats is that most Orthodox Christians are terribly intimidated around anyone well taught. Uh, with four hours a year, and let's say you go every Sunday, hey, you're up to eight hours of teaching. <laughs> I used to get that in one week in my dad's church. My father was a Presbyterian minister. I got that in a week. By the time I had graduated from high school, folks, I could quote you 500 verses from the Bible, chapter and verse, word perfect. I got $9 once from an auntie for memorizing the Sermon on the Mount. $10. No, $9. $9 for memorizing the Sermon on the Mount. That's three chapters. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. $9. You know what I memorized amongst other things? Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So taking the Bible at its face value, I didn't let it rust or corrupt. I spent it quickly. <laughs> But I had to memorize it perfectly, word for word, before I got the nine bucks. I actually spent it going to a YMCA boys camp. Third comment. Uh, it seems to me, talk about the teaching in the Orthodox churches, the, the focus in Orthodox churches is on the altar. As you very well put it, that, that's why we are there. Okay? The, the focus in the Protestant churches is on the pastor and the servant. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, when the pastor changes, the whole spirit of the congregation changes. In the Orthodox churches, it's not because the focus still is on Jesus Christ on the altar. Is it possible that there is a balance between the two, that both sides are extreme, are taking some extreme approaches to things that we, that the Protestants had left to the altar, and that the Orthodox have left the teaching? That there has to be some balance. We read in Proverbs, for example, an, uh, an improper balance is an abomination unto God. And obviously that the literal explanation here is the trading, an improper balance, but it could also be has a practical application that any concept in life, if we take it out of balance, can lead us into the wrong path. I would say, I would agree with you uh, at almost every point. Uh, I would agree, number one, we need balance. Uh, number two, I agree that for the most part, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the variety of Protestantism that I grew up in, which was utterly non-sacramental, uh, uh, focus was on Jesus, but not on the Holy Trinity, believed in the Trinity, but not there. Yes, there was imbalance. I do agree that there is imbalance amongst Orthodox if all we do is, uh, it, it is focus on the, the divine liturgy only. Now, I'm going to be a little tough here. Do you know where the heart of the teaching is done in the Orthodox Church? Vespers. And matins. Vespers and matins. Some of the most remarkable teaching you will ever hear in your life is done in great vespers and in matins. And you can trust it. You don't have to worry about it. It's the guy right. Uh, some of the most powerful spots in the teaching or in a piece, for example, we call the Dogmaticon, which is about Mary. But it's not really about Mary, it's about Jesus. You'll hear something like this, you who bore him in the flesh, who was born of the Father before all time. I mean, some of the most profound Christological doctrine is taught in just a simple stichera, a simple verse. And you know, most of us are not there for those services. 
but that's exactly the problem, Father, because we are so illiterate nowadays. I'm sorry to say that our, our grasp of concepts like this is way behind the early church. That for, right. for 90 percent of us, with all respect, to listen to something like this, unless you knew that concept, it means nothing to you. It would just go from one ear to the other. And, and Mary Sue made a point too. I think that's important. And sometimes we hear it in a language we don't really understand. I mean, even in an Arabic or a Greek or a Slavonic, that people who speak Arabic, Greek, Arabic, Greek, and Slavonic don't understand. Uh, sometimes that's that's a problem. And I would also agree. It really takes some background. I just wish there were more teaching. Let's take two or three more and. Uh, Oh, we'll take a couple of them. Those two are not mutually exclusive, and I kind of promised a guy last night I'd wait till tomorrow night <laughs> to, because uh, he said, what about the rest of the people? And I kind of promised, he couldn't come tonight, and I said I'd sort of, I'd wait until Friday night, or Saturday night. What you just said is, those are not mutually exclusive, and the little illustration I gave last night with Father Gordon and me, uh, you know, uh, being from... Uh, the living stones being fit and held together. Have you ever seen a stonemason work? Have any of you ever seen it? I mean, really, have you ever seen a stonemason work? One of his tools is a hammer. And, and I've watched them. I've watched them work on the stones and, and uh, to get them to fit. Do you know how the temple in Solomon's temple, do you know how, how many nails did they use in Solomon's temple? One. Not one. No nails. It was all put together. Uh, fitted together. Remarkable. Not a nail. That's one of the main points of it. Uh, so, those, Stacy, are not mutually exclusive uh, at all. There are no doubt people who aren't in the wall. They're not part of the structure. Uh, it, said, it says on the book of Revelation, the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. Well, but we'll talk about that. Yes. So that's a legitimate question. I can't answer the. I can't answer part of the question. I don't know why people respond to me the way they do. I, I'm such a nice guy. I can't imagine anybody not liking me. Uh, uh, that passage: "Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers." Bluntly, young people, don't marry an unbeliever. Do not marry an unbeliever. It's better to be an old maid than to marry an unbeliever. That's being, because that's union. What he's talking about in that passage is don't be in union. That's what the yoke is. Don't be united. Marriage is a union. It's not the only union. And, but it is St. Paul's illustration about being united to Christ and, and the church. Ephesians chapter 5. We read it at every wedding. Okay. Uh, so, what he's talking about there is being in union with somebody. No, I know. I, but so you must also be careful in your business relationships. Doesn't mean don't do business with unbelievers, but you got to be careful about your partnerships. I've seen a lot of Christians go under spiritually because they form partnerships that are 
where, the, where they have to participate in stuff they ought not to be participating in. Now, but your second question, when you cut off. You know, you know how you're supposed to treat unbelievers? I'm going to show you how you... Terry, I'm going to assume for a moment that you're an unbeliever. Now, how am I supposed to treat him if he's an unbeliever? Good morning, Mr. Unbeliever. How are you? Now, Terry, how are you doing? How's your family? How's your wife? How are your kids? Or if I were a southerner, I lived in Atlanta for five years. My Terry, I haven't seen you for a good age. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. How is your wife? That's how you treat an unbeliever. You're nice. Do you know who you don't have lunch with? Do you know who you don't have lunch with? Someone who was a believer and fell away. That's what St. Paul says. Someone who was in, who was united to Christ and bailed. Don't even eat with them. What do you say to that unbeliever? Good morning, Mr. Unbeliever. Ma, I haven't seen you for a day. But you don't have fellowship with them. You can't have fellowship. How can, you, how can light and darkness have fellowship? You know, there's an interesting statement in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah, what does this have to do with in the evangelical of, of trying to bring... It has nothing to do with it. It actually has nothing to do with it. All evangelism is bringing people from darkness to light. And uh, there is no union. It doesn't mean don't talk to them. It means don't come into union with them. Now, I mean, you, 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 otherwise, Paul says, in fact, in that same passage, in, what is it, 1 Corinthians 7? Uh, 